in Jesus' name. If you could stand to your feet for the word of God today. Um, we're just taking a break from our series on uh, I Have Decided, because today is Father's Day. Come on, give a shout of praise to the fathers. And uh, I'm just going to read a passage here from the Living Bible. You're free to read along with us as well if you want on the screen. Um, and it's Luke chapter 15, 11 to 32. We're going to read it from the Living Bible. And um, or take another illustration. A woman has 10 valuable coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and look in every corner of the house and sweep every nook and cranny until she finds it? And then... Won't she call in her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her? In the same way, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. To further illustrate the point, he told them this story. A man had two sons. When the younger told his father, I want my share of your estate now instead of waiting until you die, his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and took a trip to a distant land and there wasted all his money on parties and prostitutes. About the time his money was gone, a great famine swept through the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to, hide him, to hire him to feed his pigs. The boy became so hungry that even the pods he ate was feeding the swine looked good to him and no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hard men have food enough and to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hard man. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long distance away, his father saw him coming and was filled with loving pity and ran and embraced and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you and I'm, no lo and I'm not worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the slaves, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him and a jeweled ring for his finger and shoes and kill the calf we have in the fattening pen. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has returned to life. He was lost and is found, so the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard dance music coming. <laughs> dance music. <laughs> you know, he heard dance music coming from the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he said, he was told, and your father has killed a calf that was fattening and has prepared a great feast to celebrate his coming home unharmed. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've worked hard for you and, you never want, and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours came back after spending your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the finest calf we have in the place. Look, dear son, his father said to him, you and I are very close and everything I have is yours. But it is right to celebrate, for he is your brother. And he was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. You may be seated. He was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And you know what? Every one of us can see ourselves in that story. That story describes every one of us before we came to Christ. We're celebrating fathers today, and probably no passage in the entire Bible acknowledges the vital role that fathers play in the lives of their children more than the parable of the prodigal son. In a way, it's a story of contrasts, greed and generosity, Sin and righteousness, light and darkness, religion and relationship, despair and hope, aspiration and reality, failure and restoration, damnation and redemption. 
And just as the father in the story, we need to understand that as fathers, we play an essential role, uh, we play an essential part in the lives and destinies of our children. Because so many of the issues we're facing in our society today are ultimately rooted in fatherlessness. Gangs, violence, abortion, abuse, disillusionment, addiction, despair, uh, loneliness, and even suicide may be the fruit, but in many instances, fatherlessness is the root. 1 Corinthians 4 and 15, even if you have 10,000 uh, guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel and the new living, for even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. It's interesting to see how um, so many of our shops are transformed on Mother's Day. You know, aisles and aisles given over to presents to rightfully celebrate mothers. And yet, Father's Day, often there's a little table in the corner thrown to one side. And, uh, you know, I think it's an indication of how in many respects as a society we value mothers. And yet, sometimes fathers can be quite a painful um, a, a, a thing for some people when they think of their of their, of their father. And um, you know, one of the best attended days in church um, is Mother's Day, and one of the worst attended is Father's Day. Um, so, so let's be honest before we start, there are many who have been disappointed or hurt by fathers. I mean, the very term father may bring uh, sadness, pain, or, or bittersweet memories to you. On, on Mother's Day, women are rightfully celebrated, and this is entirely appropriate, but Father's Day, sometimes men can come to church and feel like they're being criticized or attacked. But this message isn't about lecturing or disrespecting fathers who are failing in their duties, but simply to encourage every one of us to reach for the high calling of God in Christ. And truly, it is a high calling. And so today, I simply want you to see the heart of your heavenly father, who is ultimately all of our example as, as men, is, 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 he is our example, and hopefully cause us to reach out to Jesus to help us to become the men that by the grace of God that we can be. And so I wanna point out the high standard that we have been given to follow because ultimately God doesn't describe himself as a mother even though in some ways there's probably nothing quite like a mother's love, amen? And uh, I, I think it's important to understand that and, and certainly there are aspects to God's love that are motherly and yet God describes himself as a father. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, teach us to pray the way John the Baptist taught his disciples. And it's interesting how Jesus responds in, uh, in, uh, in verse uh, two. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place that he ceased, that the disciples said to him, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So he said to him, when you pray, say our Father in heaven. And so as fathers, we need to understand that we are an earthly reflection of a heavenly reality. And, and that's a very sobering thing to consider. Um, and, and so, anyway, as fathers, we need to represent, remember, we represent him. And, um, uh, it, and so, again, it's, 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 it's a high standard for us to reach for. Um, and, and let me say this, it's hard for kids to believe in a loving heavenly father who will always be for, there for them when they have an earthly father who abandons them. Amen? And so, again, Deuteronomy 21 and verse 17 um, a, a, a addresses uh, the fact that the younger son was uh, entitled to a third of his father's estate, um, uh, but it would have been at the death of his uh, father. But, you know, I think it's sad that it was the son, <laughs> praise the Lord, it was the son who initiated this, pro this process. Um, disrespecting his father and ultimately disregarding the life of his father and the authority of his father, in essence saying to his father, I wish you were dead as I want uh, what I would get when you die. And by the way, I'm not willing to wait until then. 
And so the sun goes off into the world and parties, these, you know, parties it up um, until invariably this, this house of cards comes crashing down around him uh, as inef- inevitably it, it would happen. Um, but again, he went off into the world with his father's money but without his father's blessing. And uh, he goes off into the world and he builds a new persona and he buys designer clothes, making fake friends and you know, wasting in days what his father had accumulated over a lifetime. And, um, and, and it all ended in tears uh, because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Romans 3 verse 23. It says the wages of sin is death. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man but its end is in the way of death. And so, yeah, there is, the Bible talks about the pleasure of sin for a season, but that season always comes to an end and it's always shorter than you might imagine. And this is why, again, it's, it's important for us to understand what the word of God says. Ironically, this young man pursues freedom and ends up in slavery. He followed his carnal desires and he ended up in, he, he followed his, his, his dreams and he ended up in a nightmare. And uh, because Jonah 2 verse 8 tells us, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. And so again, if we pursue idols, we will end up in a place of, of uh, it, you know, pain in a place of of, uh, sorrow and a place of of failure, but you are forsaking your own mercy, the Bible says, if you regard worthless idols, if if that is what you aspire to, what you pursue. And so he lifted himself up in pride and he was brought low. Proverbs 29, 23 warns us, a man's pride will bring him low. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there. Because while he ends up penniless, uh, destitute, uh, uh, friendless, and and it's interesting that the friends disappeared at the same time as the money. And again, I do find there's something slightly comical in in the idea that this guy is here and he's tattered Armani clothes in a pig pen covered in in, in poo. And uh, because again, that's where sin always just brings you to a place of, of just... Uh, a failure and destruction, and um, he ends up starving. You know, the King James says he joined himself to, um, you know, a person in that land, and the literal translation means he glued himself to him. He was he was that desperate, and maybe he was somebody he once partied with, and now he ends up as a slave to that person. And um, so, anyway, uh, his designer clothes now are in rags. He's working at feeding pigs, and in this dark humiliating place, he finally comes to his senses. Because sometimes, it's only when we hit rock bottom that we finally find the rock. You see, Jesus Christ is the rock. He is the foundation. Deuteronomy 32, 31, for their rock is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Psalm 62 and two, truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress, I will never be shaken. Psalm 18, 46, the Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Are you building your life on the rock or like this young man, are you building your life on the sand? Now, unfortunately, he had to learn the hard way, but at least he finally woke up and came to a place of repentance and turned back towards home. But what is astounding in this story is not the son's capacity to sin because again, uh, if we were to be honest, um, we can all see something of ourselves in that young man. But, and so, a- again, there's nothing astounding about his behavior because we've all been there. Like the country song, I've got friends in low places. You know, we've all been to low places at times in our lives. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But what is actually amazing is the father's capacity to show grace and forgive. We see a true father's heart, and this earthly father reflects the heart of our heavenly father, because that last song we sang, I think so beautifully exemplifies the heart of the father, because yes, Christ died on the cross, greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends, but remember, it's so God so loved the world. It was the heart of the father that moved him to give his son, and we must never forget that. The cross is eternal proof that you are loved, that you matter, that there's a God who sees you, that there's a God who values you. And so anyway, 
we see a father's heart um, because we see a man who wants the best for his child and who makes the difficult decision to allow his son to go and learn some hard lessons. But instead of giving his son a lecture on his return, he gives him grace. Amazingly, he loves and lifts his son. He offers him grace and mercy and kindness when all that he deserves is condemnation. And it was this same breathtaking grace that moved the slave trader John Newton to write the the, the words of the timeless hymn, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now was found. I was blind, but now I see. He brought those words straight out of the gospel, really, because this, your son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so... You know, John Newton, I believe, stood in awe of of the amazing grace of God towards sinful men. Uh, a, A world that decides to cancel and condemn and never ever forgive clearly doesn't understand grace, but we should. Cancel culture is based on this idea that redemption isn't real, that you, a, leper can't, a leopard can't change its spots, that a person can't change. But the, the essence of the gospel message is that Jesus Christ gives us the power to change, no matter where we have failed or fallen. I, I mean, because listen, none of us would want our, our lowest moments put up on that screen. And yet God, notwithstanding our failure, still loves us and covers us with his grace and tells us he believes in us. And so, anyway, if anybody should understand grace, it is us because we serve a God who can make all things new. Remember this, you might be in a dark place today, but you are not beyond the reach of grace. Revelation 21, 4 to 6. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Hallelujah. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said, It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Behold, I make all things new. Do you know Jeremiah 31 2 says, Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest. The people who survived the sword found grace, and you might feel like you're like that in your life, that you've, you know, destruction and devastation has come into your life. Maybe you've fallen morally, maybe you've messed your life up in a way, and and you feel like, uh, you know, everything has been burnt up. Well, you know, the Bible I read says God gives us beauty for ashes. If all you have is ashes, surrender it to him. Surrender the ashes of your life and watch what God does with it, amen? The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Have you ever been embraced when you deserved to be rebuked? Included when you should have been excluded? Shown love when you expected to be rejected? There is no feeling in the world like that. There's no feeling like that, the grace of God. You see, the father saw his son while he was still a long distance away because he was scanning the horizon literally every day since his son left. And contrary to all traditions and cultural norms, as an older man, he ran to his son. And when his son tried to grovel uh, as a slave, he embraced him as a son. I want to say that again. When, When his son tried to grovel as a slave, he embraced him as a son. And this is the beauty of the gospel. You see, the father replaced his filthy rags with a beautiful robe. He put a ring of authority on his finger and sandals on his bare feet. And again, throwing a celebration feast for his long lost son. This is a picture of the father heart of God because He doesn't see where you've been, he sees where you're going. He doesn't see you for what you are, he sees you for what he's called you to be, amen? This is the Father heart of God. Yes, at times we're, you know, flat in our face and we've made a mess of things, God lovingly lifts us, cleanses us with his blood and says, come on child, let's move forward from this in Jesus' name. This is the grace of God. This is the heart of God in Jesus' name. He rejoices over you no matter where you have been or what you have done. And again, you may have been in the pig pen of sin. Haven't we all? Haven't we all? But you know what? 
he still celebrates and welcomes us as sons and daughters of the king because he sees us through the blood. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You might feel like you have nobody who loves you or cares about you, but you have a father in heaven who loves you and celebrates and believes in you. You see, I'm talking today about a father's heart. And please understand, this applies to you whether you're single or married. I believe the greatest need in the world today is for fathers. Even if you're not a biological father, you need to have a father's heart. You know, Billy Graham said this, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. Certainly as a pastor, it's my desire to, you know, as a father to raise up, you know, men and women in their calling. And, you know, to see Linda being elected like that, I believe that's part of her calling. You know, we want to see men and women being raised up into positions of authority, whether in politics, media, academia, business, uh, ministry, whatever. We want to see you raised up and connecting with the call of God in your lives. You could say that fathers are the unsung heroes of our day, serving, protecting, and providing for your family. I want all of the fathers today to stand up for a moment. We want to honor you. If you're a father, just please stand to your feet. Come on, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Look at these guys. Praise God. Come on. Show them some love today. Come on, guys. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. (laughs) So blessed to see Billy here with his his son, Liam. You know, they come every week. Praise the Lord. 80 80 odd years of age in here worshiping the Lord. Shouldn't tell your age. Amen. It doesn't look it. 80, what did I say, 70, amen, whatever you are, glory to God, it's good to have you here, (laughs) praise you Jesus, so in a world that says that fathers are an optional extra, what unique contribution does a father make, firstly a father's provision, the greatest gift a father can provide for his children isn't a trust fund or some ex- expansive business portfolio or estate. The greatest gift a man can give his children is to love them and their mother. A, a father who does this gives their child a sense of security and well being, and the value of this is incalculable. Amen, because the the very same love that calls us as fathers to provide financially uh, for our our children, it's the love of God in us that calls us to do that. And I know I'm stating the obvious, but you know, unfortunately, there are fathers who fail in their God-appointed role as provider, and and, and if you've experienced that in your life, I'm praying that God will, will heal your heart in that regard, because that leaves a wound. Amen, that leaves a wound of of rejection and hurt, particularly, like I said, as a child. But like I said, there are men who fail in that role as provider because they leave their money in the bookies or the bar or the brothel, or they simply abandon the family home, or uh, because of today's superficial hookup culture, never establish um, a home in the first place. And uh, let me say this, at times a man may go through tough, tough patch where due to health or economic circumstances he struggles to find a job or to provide, but that's very different to a man who isn't even trying. You see, a father's provision is ultimately rooted in a father's love. We give because we live, we give because we love. And those who don't love don't understand. I had an uncle who was a bachelor all of his life, and when he heard I was getting married, I was only 25, he said to me, are you mad? What are you doing feeding another man's daughter? And um, I, I, I guess it was just as well he stayed single with that attitude. But you know, I would put that under stinking thinking because the most natural thing for you as a man when you fall in love is to spend your money on, 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 your, on, on, your, on your wife and on, you know, when you're single, you, you, you buy her flowers, you, you do things like that. And um, uh, again, uh, ladies don't marry him if he's cheap because if he's cheap, let me say this, if he's looking to have the bill when you're single, wait till you get married, baby, it's gonna get worse. Okay, so, uh, you know, as a man, I believe it's, it's a guy godly thing to want to bless your, your wife and to provide for her. But, um, but anyway, um, those who don't love don't um, understand. 
how, how this world so desperately needs men who have a father's heart. You see, a father is irreplaceable, as are mothers, because there is a supernatural love that a man has for his wife and his child. And ladies, if he loves you, he will marry you. If he loves you, he will marry you. I appreciate to many that sounds old fashioned, um, impractical, but if he won't marry, he's not an honorable man because he's not honoring God's eternal order. Now I would say this, if you're newly saved, um, there is grace for you and there's time to get your life in order. And we've done that on a number of occasions. People who get saved and they're living together and whatever and we work with them. And you know, there are people in this church today that when they got saved were living together. Today they're married, they have children, they're happy. You know, we, we work with you where you are. But let, let's understand that, you know, the eternal principles of God are that uh, uh, this is the way God has ordained it, okay? And so, uh, make no mistake, God has has ordained it so that sex and the family that will almost invariably follow be contained within the covenant of marriage. It is that sacred a gift. You see, family is forever, and, and therefore as men, we are called to faithfully provide for our families. But a, a father's responsibility to provide goes way beyond mere financial provision. He provides a name for his wife and his child. Personally, I don't believe in double-barreled names, and um, I, I don't mean to cause offense, but, but contrary to what many feminists might claim, the custom of a wife taking her husband's surname isn't some pointless tradition or meaningless hang up from the past. It's not misogyny, but rather it's an essential part of identity. And, and I appreciate I'm speaking right now to a generation that in many respects have had the, the you know, 50 years of feminist brainwashing, the, uh, uh, particularly with the kind of handmaid's tale ideology that seeks to set men and women as uh, in competition and as enemies of each other. Um, that, that is a relatively new development in our society. Study thousands of years of human history and you'll see that men and women worked together. We complement each other. We, we are different but equal. And, and God, you know, causes us, like I said, to complement each other in, in, in that regard. But, but, but anyway, um, uh, as a wife, you take the name of your husband because it's symbolic of the fact that he is the head of your home and that you're under his authority. And, and that shouldn't be controversial for those who read the Bible and understand divine order. God gave the blueprint for marriage in Genesis chapter 2, 15. This reason the man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. And so we see here the principle that a man leaves his father and mother, and not a mother and mother, father and father, um, father and mother, and are joined, that is the, the, the ceremony of matrimony, that's covenant, and the two become one flesh, that is sex. And so sex comes after marriage, not before, but our society, because the sexual revolution has turned everything on its head, and this is why we're seeing society unraveling at the seams, because we have rejected the order of God, the principles of God, and then we act surprised when we see the devastation, the collateral damage all around us in our society and broken homes and kids that are confused. That's good preaching, Pastor John. That's it. But what was the first thing that happened after God revealed his eternal order? A man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. Genesis 3 verse 1. Hath God said. That was the first thing that happened. You see, the whole concept of pride and the ugly flag that they keep making uglier are, are ultimately rooted in the question. It is an ugly flag. I don't care what you think. Feel free. Be offended. But that flag and all that it symbolizes is rooted in one question. Hath God said? Hath God said? Hath God said male and female? Or rather, could there be 254 other genders? Hath God said? Marriage? Hath God said? You can just live together. You know, you gotta take your car for a test drive before you buy it. It's this, this stinking thinking. And so, again, I think we need to understand that God is a God of order. 
And so much of this toxic feminist ideology that represents masculinity as toxic is rooted in this question, hath God said, i.e., we know better. We shall be as God, redefining what is right and good, and we've been doing it over the last 10 years in, uh, in so many nations, governments, in their legal system, redefining what is right and good. According to this ideology, men are unnecessary, and masculinity is dangerous and toxic. But let me say this, the very existence of the Western world as we know it has been predicated upon strong men who are willing to fight for their families, and history confirms this. This is why they don't want you to study history anymore. In, let me say the very fact, the only reason that stood between starvation and slavery for women and children were men, and in particular, fathers who were willing to lay down their lives for their families. And yet feminists over the last 50 years have relentlessly attacked men, and then you have women throwing up their hands today saying, we're all the men. When you undermine and disrespect and ultimately demonize the concept of masculinity, just watch the stupid Barbie movie and see that mentality. And then they wonder why, why they end up with blue hair and cats, you know? I'm just saying, we, if our society is to have a future, we have to return to tradition. We have to return to family. We have to return to faith. We have to return to understanding God made us different and that's okay as male and female. But like I said, as a result of this relentlessly attacking of masculinity, the world is not a safer or a better place today. This is a fatherless generation with many confused men and women because it is hard to be what you did not see. If you grew up in a home without a dad, it's hard for you to, to, to try to be a man. It's tried hard for you for a woman to understand how a man is meant to behave. This is why we see so much confusion, so much brokenness, so much pain. This is why we see an epidemic of mental health issues among young people. So much of it is rooted in fatherlessness. And our inability to acknowledge that or say that is an indictment of how dis disconnected we have become from God's blueprint for the home. It all comes back to fathers or the lack thereof. Do you know in English common law, much of our law is based on English common law, we see the concept of coverture. It asserts the reason why a woman takes a man's surname. According to the Oxford language, um, uh, co coverture is the legal status of a married woman considered to be under her husband's protection and authority. Uh, protection and authority, not ownership, as, as has been you know, so many times disingenuously portrayed in that regard. But in reality, this principle is, is rooted in a much older tradition that goes back to the Garden of Eden. You take his name because in God's eyes you are now one. You are in a covenant. It's not a contract or a commitment, it's a covenant. You are one flesh. You are heirs together of the grace of life, 1 Peter 3 and verse seven. We're equal in value but different in ability. Men can't give birth or breastfeed. And, and yet, even in this union of equals, there is a divine order because Again, the Bible says that the man is the head, and we see the ancient acknowledgement of this principle of headship from the very beginning in the garden. God, um, Adam was created first, that's headship. Adam was put over the garden by God and named the animals headship. The woman was created by God from man and for man and named by man headship. The Bible addresses Adam's sin, not Adam and Eve's sin, headship. Romans 5 verse 12, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. This is the principle of, of headship. The contemporary English version, Adam sinned, and, the sin, and that sin brought, de brought death into the world. Now everyone has sinned, and so everyone must die. You see, as the head, the responsibility to provide is on you. Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. Do we fear Christ as the head of the church, oppressing or abusing or dominating or manipulating us? No, of course not. He laid down his life for us, 
And so as men, we must understand this is a very high standard. When God draws a parallel between the love of a husband for his wife and the love of Christ for the church. And I, let me say this, as men, this is something, and particularly as fathers, one of the things I absolutely know we will give an account for in eternity is our behavior as fathers. How do we behave? How do we love our wife? How do we love our children? So whatever enemy we face today, know this, Christ faced it before you. Christ faced it before you. Does, does headship give us as men the right to subjugate or enslave or, or dominate our families? Of course not. It's an acknowledgement of responsibility, not an acknowledgement of power. You see, love calls us to serve. This is why a father goes out and works every day to support his family. You know, I appreciate in the world we, we are in today that bo both uh, the, the man and the woman often work, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. There's nothing wrong with having a career. But ultimately, as men, we must understand the responsibility to provide is ours. This is why in the Titanic, they put women and children on the lifeboats. You know, many of these men choosing death before dishonor. You know, some of the richest men in the world were on that boat and they chose to stay on that boat and drown and instead allow women and children go first. I often wonder if it was today, how many women would be screaming out for equality in that moment? No, no, throw me, throw me into the icy waters. How many men today would demand equality? No, no, you've taken 300 women, now you have to take 300 men. That's not progress. These were the richest men in the world, and yet they chose death before dishonor because they instinctively understood as men, we're called to go first, we're called to provide, we're called to lay our lives down. As men, we're called to lovingly lead and lay down our lives for our family. You see, selfishness and fatherhood have no place in the same sentence. We're called by God to provide. My dad got up every day, put on a suit and tie, and went out, and he worked. And I, I thank God I saw that, I saw his work ethic. Um, he never took a sick day. Every day he went to work and there were days when he was sick because he was out all night drinking with his buddies, but he went to work. Welcome to Ireland. They say the Irish put the fun back into dysfunction. But he worked and he put me in my my, my seven brothers and sisters through college and he fed and he clothed us. You see, a father provides. He, he did his best. He did his best with what he knew. And you see, a father provides. God first made the garden, then he put the man in there to work that garden. So firstly, a father's uh, provision. Secondly, a father's protection. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, they protected their child. This is a calling, particularly on a father, is to protect your children. Moses would never have lived to be the deliverer of Israel and thus the one who made the, redeem, the way for the redeemer of all mankind were it not for a father and a mother who protected him as a baby. Now a father and a mother's protection may look different at times because we're different by design and we see the world differently. Joanna's laughing because she knows. You see, mothers have a maternal instinct that men don't have, but as fathers we are called to protect. Because while a mother may see a danger in personality, as a man you may see it in ideology. Certainly, as a pastor, I will say this, many of the public stands that I've taken, I have been mindful of the generations that are behind me. I didn't do it because it would grow the church. I knew I would lose members over the, some of the stands, stands I've taken, particularly regarding the sexualization of education. But my job is to preach the gospel. Whether people stay or leave is up to them. But you know, some of those public stands, I've done so being mindful of the generations that are behind me. And, and as a consequence, we lost church members. Uh, you know, I've lost friends in ministry because they don't necessarily see things generationally and they bought into this stupid church growth movement which means you'll never say anything offensive, you'll never take a position that will make you look bad or make people feel uncomfortable. I don't believe that's our job. 
But anyway, I have no regrets because we must protect our children from those who want to indoctrinate, confuse, and radicalize them. And be under no illusions, the, come on. There is an agenda to introduce all of this indoctrination into our education curriculum that really is focusing not on educating our children but on turning them into activists, whether climate change activists or LGBT activists or all this other stupidity that is a dead end road that will not bring them anywhere. It will only bring pain and devastation into their lives. You see, a father's strength is given for a reason. I think we've discovered over the last few years, particularly uh, you know, all of the feminists who are constantly demanding equality, we've come to realize men and women are not equal, particularly when it comes to sports. We've seen men break all sorts of world records for women, men who are who, you know, average, at best, um, athletes, because God made us stronger. He made us physically stronger in the majority of instances. And that pr- strength is given for us to protect, not to oppress or, 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 or to, to hurt or to harm. Men are, strong, men are strong because of God's design. And that strength is not given to harm or intimidate, but to protect. And let me say this, we protect because we connect. Connection is important. You gotta still date that woman. You gotta buy her flowers. You gotta go out for walks and talk to her. It's important because we protect because we, we connect. Don't be sitting like a vegetable in front of a TV for days at a time, okay? Um, connection is important. That's why it's important to hold the child. Oh no, that's the, that's the woman's child. You know, my dad was old school. He, was, he, you know, he had eight kids. My mom had eight kids. He, he was obviously involved, but um, uh, he was old school. He, 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 would, he would drive her up to Cork, the Bon Secours Hospital. He'd drop her and say, give me a call in a few days when you're ready to come home. That was it. That was, it was, it was a one woman show, but um, you know, they, they were the, the old days. And um, uh, anyway, I think that's, that's kind of sad. But, um, but this is why it's important as, as a dad, you hold the child, that, that you hug the child, you talk to them, you play with them, you spend time with them, you read bedtime stories to them. Because you know, mom has been carrying that baby for nine months, so she has a head start um, with regard to connection. Okay, um, to her, much of this is instinctive, whereas men, for us, this has to be deliberate. We have to make the effort, we have to try. As a man, it's important you bond with your child. Joanna used to breastfeed and I used to burp them. That was our, that was our deal, okay? So she'd, she'd breastfeed and I'd be like, Bleh. you know, just a little burp. And, and if they were crying during the night, I'd get the child and I'd walk the floor and I'd pray in tongues. And I remember just the little baby would be just looking up at you and you'd be praying in the spirit, you know, because, and, and there was a connection in that moment with those, those children. And um, so connection is important. I think, I think much of the emotional incontinence that our generation are showing, particularly young people, you know, is, is a reflection of the fact that, you know, they, they haven't had that connection with their, with, with their dad, particularly growing up, I think. You know, you're seeing a lot of these kids acting crazy in the colleges. You know, these are kids that have never been disciplined as children. Uh, in many instances, they were given gifts rather than time. And, um, and it's showing up in, when they're in their adult years. And so, um, Psalm 127 and 3, Behold, children are heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Our children are our heritage. We have to fight for them. Don't let the devil steal our sons and our daughters, amen? It, it, it means we have to be discerning about who and what they're exposed to. You're not wise if you allow your kids, you know, un, uncontrolled access to media um, and it, it, you don't filter their friends. You need to filter their friends. Proverbs 13 and 20, it says, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. You know, there's no doubt there's a lot of programming and indoctrination happening online and even in our schools. So be aware and don't substitute gifts for time. There's one father last week told me about how he inquired into his local school with regards to what the children were gonna be taught um, in, in relation to sex education. And this was a little child, he was shocked. He was shocked what they were gonna be teaching him. So again, protection is important. Thirdly, a father's affirmation. 
Um, so he had received the five talents, came and brought the five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five talents more. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You're faithful, faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He received two talents, came, saying, Lord, you uh, gave me two talents. Look, I've gained two talents besides them. His Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, here you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would receive back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. To everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you know that eternity ends with, well done, good and faithful servant, or go away? That's why labels don't scare me. Because I want to live my life with one eye on the judgment seat of Christ. Because I understand this. It ends with acceptance or rejection. Affirmation or condemnation. Blessing or cursing. Heaven or hell. You see, those who are welcomed into the blessed eternal kingdom of God are affirmed by the Father. Well done, good and faithful servant. And, and ultimately, that's all any of us want to hear is well done. And, and amazingly, this is how the Father greeted and welcomed his prodigal son, welcome home. He welcomed him with open arms. Do you know the elder brother couldn't understand grace? How many of you ever are grateful for the fact that the son wasn't greeted by the elder brother? What kind of a welcome would he have got from him? Him. What kind of a, a, a response would he have been given? Um, I'm sure it would have been very, very differently. Amen? And so this is the reality. The elder, elder brother couldn't understand grace because he was operating under a works mentality. For him, it was about religion, not relationship. Law, not love. You know, ironically, um, you know, many of God's children today operate under the same spirit of, uh, unknowingly of course, but it's a religious spirit that stops them from enjoying God's presence and God's peace. And I would include God's blessings. Do you know some people have made such a religion out of what they call the prosperity gospel that they literally dismiss and discount all of the many promises of God relating to healing and prosperity and joy that God has written into his word. I, I honestly can't understand why you would feed on some of that reform doctrine that says everything has finished. And then people wonder why they can't receive healing when they get sick. They wonder why they can't receive blessing. If you're filling yourself with that unbelief and cynicism, well, you know, if you feed on that stuff that is constantly doing hit jobs on, you know, the Pentecostal movement and on, you, you know, relegates everything under the blessing, oh, that's prosperity gospel. I, I think that's an offensive term because you're taking a sacred word like the gospel and you're making it into something that it's not. You have to be really ignorant of what the Bible says to decide that you know, God doesn't care about your financial welfare. To try to claim that God doesn't want you well or healed. You have to dismiss and ignore hundreds of scriptures throughout the Bible that says, you know, beloved, I wish above all else that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God wants you healthy. God wants you blessed. It's only when you're blessed that you can be a blessing. Could somebody say amen? Of course there are those who go off to extremes and make a God of money, but you can see them for what they are. Amen, but don't throw out the baby with the bat water is all I'm saying. God cares about you. He wants you healthy, he wants you happy, he wants you blessed. Fact is, the greatest advertisement for the, the gospel is somebody who is blessed, somebody who is filled with joy. You're going through there, your kids are hungry, they're badly clothed, and you want to witness to your neighbor about Jesus? You know, I, I respect what Alex said, you know. You don't want people to hear how broke you are throwing in your, you know, one euro coin. I'm, I'm saying, and you know, praise God, you may be there in that place today, but don't stay there. God doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to move forward. He wants you to take ground. He wants you to get healed. He wants you to get a job. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to own your own home. Could somebody say amen? Thank you, Lord. I'm taking that in Jesus' name. 
Come on, you don't want to be renting for the rest of your life. See, people have been brainwashed and programmed into, you know, living a life that's so far below what the father has for them. I'm a father. I want my children blessed. I want them happy. I want them when the time comes, you know, to, to own their own home. I want them to be well provided for. I'm far from perfect. How much more does your father in heaven care about your needs? That's the spirit of the elder brother. How many of us as God's, uh, how many of us as children would cry out to our dad, dad, look, as we tried to jump over the dog with our bike and ended up hopping our head off the ground? Why do, why do we do that? Why do we want our dad to see us? Because we all yearn for attention, affirmation, and encouragement. Do you know even Christ only entered into his ministry after the Father affirmed him at the baptism in the Jordan River? Matthew 3, 13 to 17, a voice came from heaven, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Again at the transfiguration, I don't have time to read it, Matthew 17, one to eight, a voice, it says, this is my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. How many men spend their lives trying to gain the affirmation of a father long dead? You see, affirmation and identity are reasons why children seek to know a father who never made time for them or discover who their father actually was. I remember years ago, Joanna used to watch that program where people would try and find out who their, their father was. Why do people do that? Well, because there's a yearning to, you know, a, father, a father's affirmation. There's something in hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. There's something in, in, in knowing your father. Psalm 103, 13, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. A godly father can be a great blessing to his children, affirming them in the face of a world that tells them that they're not enough. You see, a father's affirmation is an antidote to the discouragement, lies, and intimidation of the enemy. I, I love this here in Genesis 35 and verse 18. Rachel was about to die, but with her last breath, she named her baby Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow. The boy's father, however, called him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Do you know that, fa- that little boy was about to have a label put upon him, a lifetime label attached to him in the form of a name which would forever remind him and those around him that his birth was the cause of his mother's death. And this was not deliberate on the part of his mother. She was in pain at that time, but hurting people hurt people. But his father immediately tore that label off him saying, you're not the son of my sorrow. You're the son of my right hand. You know what the father did? He chose to bless and not curse. You know some of you have struggled all of your life because because at times you were cursed when you should have been blessed. There were times when you were humiliated when you should have been forgiven and encouraged. And so again, we must understand this is a, a tremendous responsibility as fathers. Do you know that as a father you can speak curse or blessing over your children? You can do that. Thank you so much to me. As a father, you can speak curse or you can speak blessing. Because when we say, you're so lazy, you're so stupid, and sometimes we're just speaking out of frustration or anger. When we say, you could never do that, you could never accomplish that, you, you could never go there or have that or uh, you, you know, do that, we're not affirming, rather we're attacking their character, their hopes, and their ambitions. We're invalidating and denying their dream. You see, you know, some of those dreams may be God-given even if they seem impossible. Do you know that words are seeds? And every seed produces a harvest. This is why we need to be mindful of the words that we are speaking. Every seed brings a harvest. That's why we need to lift, encourage, and affirm our children. And we need to acknowledge when they do right as well as when they do wrong. You know what our tendency is? Correct the wrong and ignore the right. And I'll put my hands up on that. You know, as, as parents, we have a tendency to just correct the wrong but ignore when they do right. And because that's most likely what our parents did as well. I mean, have you ever got a tongue lashing as a kid? Are you happy now? Are you happy with what you did with yourself? You know, uh, or you should be ashamed of yourself. How many times do you hear that as a kid? You should be ashamed of yourself. You know, you'll never amount to anything. You see, no, we need to speak words of life 
and love and blessing over our children and watch them thrive. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. Five words that will change your child's life. I am proud of you. I am proud of you. I, I love you. You know, Mike and the Mechanics, any of you remember the 80s, they had a song about in the living years. I wish, it, uh, it's a song about his father saying, I wish I could have told him in the living years. Say it in the living years. It's too late to admit when we die that we don't see eye to eye. So say it. Say it. I love you. I forgive you. I believe in you. You can do it. L learn to, to say it in the living years. Believe in them, affirm them, even if nobody else does. Will they fail at times? Of course they will. But believe in them and affirm them anyway. I'm reminded of the saying, love me when I least deserve it. That's when I need it most. You know, I, I like this quote by uh, 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 Jim, uh, Jim Valvano. He was an American basketball player, coach, and broadcaster. And he said this, my father gave me the greatest gift anyone could give another person. He believed in me. You know, as mothers, as fathers, let's make sure we believe in our children. Just give me three or four minutes and I'm finished. We've looked at a father's provision, a father's protection, a father's affirmation, fourthly, a father's wisdom. Fathers, children need your wisdom. When they do and say stupid things, and they will, remember, you have the benefit of years. They're idealistic and often you know, naive with regards to the ways of the world, but we have the benefit of experience. And you can't put a new head on old shoulders, as the saying goes. And so don't quench their dreams, simply share some of the wisdom that you have. Tim Russert said this, the older I get, the smarter my father seems to get. He was a US journalist, and I, I think that the older you get, and I don't know any of you that are getting older, you look back and say, well, that makes sense why my father said this. That makes sense why my father did that, you know. Joshua 24, 14. Know therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve you the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Joshua had the wisdom to understand that success without a successor is failure. He was determined to bring his family with him on this journey of faith. Paul and Silas said the same thing to the jailer in Acts 16. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your household. You see, wisdom causes us to bring our family with us. Is your life an example of, as a father, is your life an example of what to do or what not to do? How to live or how not to live. How to win or how to fail. Ephesians 6 and 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We have a sacred responsibility to instruct our children in the ways of God. You know, over the last number of months, we, we have a little dog, and um, uh, I love opening the window, and he puts his paws and puts his head out, you know, and, um, he, he, loves it. he loves the fresh air and we're, and I, I don't know how many times Julie would say, Dad, close the window, the dog might fall out. And I'm saying, he's not stupid, Julie. Come on, give me a break. And you know, when we, when we drive through the town, he loves coming with us in the car because uh, if you open the window, he'll bark at all the dogs. Sometimes people are walking and they're like, because there's this dog barking at them, they don't know where he's come from. But he loves it, it's his, you know, he's a little dog, he doesn't get, it, it, it's his little, you know, boost for the day, he loves it. But the last day we were driving along and um, I had the window open again, he's got his paws and he sees a dog, next to him, whoo, leaps, jumped out of the car. We're doing about 50 k's an hour. I'm, I was like, I remember Julie just looked at me. I got out and picked up the dog. There was a guy walking the dog, looking at me with a really judgmental stare. Uh, I put him, thank, thanks be to God, he wasn't hurt, you know. No, he had a little, he had a little scratch. You see, no, he had a little scratch under the bottom of his jaw. I mean, he didn't break a leg or his tail or whatever. He was fine. Oh, you see, women and men see things differently. She's like, oh, my poor little dog. I mean, we were driving up and I said, Julie, you do not say a word to your mother. This did not happen. But it's, it's, it's sad when your 12-year-old has more sense than you, okay? 
So anyway, lastly, I want to talk about a father's motivation. Two minutes and I'm finished. We, we've talked about a father's provision, a father's protection. Um, a, 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 again, a, a, a father's affirmation, a father's wisdom. Lastly, a father's motivation. Do you know as a father, you can play a part in preparing your child and motivating them for greatness. As a parent, you have a supernatural ability to speak to the soul of your child, to motivate or deflate, to lift up or te- tear down, to bless or to curse. You see, as men, we're called to motivate. So from today, fathers, your name is Mr. Motivation. Think about it, because as a father, you're there for your child's first step. You're, you're there to teach them to kick a ball, to, to ride a bike, to throw a punch, to jump off a table. And yes, I taught all my kids to throw a punch. I think it's important. My dad did it for me, and I'm glad he did. Um, it enabled me to deal with some, uh, some problems in my life at, at various stages. <laughs> but as a woman, you're there to nurture. As a father, you're there to motivate. You're there to teach them to take risks, to have some fun. I used to throw my kids from their toddlers up in the air. And I remember we had a, a double ceiling with, a, with a, a window, a, a Velux window. But I remember I used to throw Naomi up. Her head used to go up into the, into the box of the window. And the kids used to love it. And Joanne used to go, ah, I can't watch. But I never dropped them. Um, yeah, I, I never did. Just, just put that out there. Um, but I, I used to make ramps for them on, on the bike, and you know, you can't keep them wrapped up in cotton wool. And, and let me just say, look, don't, don't go out today and build a ramp, and then if your kid breaks his arm, blame me. Pastor John told me to do it. You're responsible, <laughs> okay? But, you know, those fun memories will stay in their hearts. You know, it's like the woman who says to her dad, I may have outgrown your lap, but I'll never outgrow your heart. You see, a father motivates because of the example he gives. Give your daughter an example of how to be treated by how she sees how you treat her mother and and how you treat your own mother if she's still alive. Amen? Remember, there's no use saying, do as I do. Uh, Do as I say, not as I do, because they will do as you do. It's sobering to consider the example we may give may undermine our profession of faith. Because what you're saying may be drowned out by what you're doing. Your kids will love and obey the word of God if you live and obey the word of God. The American evangelist, D.L. Moody, as the worship group come forward, said this. A man ought to live so that everyone knows he's a Christian, and most of all, his family ought to know. So motivate them to pray, to worship, to serve the Lord by the example you provide in your home. And let it be real. Don't be a hypocrite. Amen. We need to live this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let your life so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. And so we can give our kids an example of how to live their lives. We can serve him with passion. We can serve him with truth. If you could stand to your feet today in Jesus' name. Could you show your appreciation for all of the fathers here one more time in Jesus' name. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just want to pray a blessing on every man in this place, Lord. I pray that you will help us to be the men you've called us to be in Jesus' name. I thank you for raising up strong men, Lord, who will love their wife, love their children, be men of honor, be men of truth, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord. Forgive us for where we have fallen short. Forgive us, Lord, for where we have misrepresented our heavenly Father by how we have behaved in Jesus' name. But we thank you, Lord, that just as the Father in the parable offered grace to his son, so too you offer grace to us from where we have fallen short. And so we thank you for the gift of grace. We thank you, Father, for this day, the gift of this new day. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you this question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you have peace with God? Because like I said, this ends with salvation or separation, heaven or hell. Are you saved? Do you have peace with God? Because Again, you can never be the man or the father God wants you to be until you know the heavenly father. And you might say, well, how how can I do that? Well, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus hung and bled and died on that cross so that we could be saved, so that we could be forgiven, so we could be free. If you've never asked Jesus into your life, but today you would like to accept Christ as your savior, you can respond. You can say yes to Jesus Christ. So if you've never 
receive Jesus as your Savior. And if you don't have that assurance that if this was your final day on planet Earth that you would go to heaven, you can respond and say yes. So put your hand up today if you'd like to accept Jesus as your Savior. Amen. God bless you. You see that hand. Is there anybody else here today? You're ready to surrender your life to Jesus. Don't miss your moment. If you're not right with the